Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. recording okay um we just wait a minute or two more see oh okay <laughs> oh carol um yeah. i need to know uh the pdf that you just gave me yeah am i um you can share you've got that as a backup i can okay we're gonna do this we're gonna go to the share screen well, I remember that, and then I I can pull mine up from my end. But if anything happens, you'll have it on your end to pull up. Okay. okay. And so I go to your name and click on the three dots and make you a co-host. Yes. Yes. So that you can share. Correct. All right. So you are now a co-host. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Try for a moment to put yours uh, to see if if it pops up. Okay. Your PDF. Oh, my share screen. Okay. Oh. Valerie, it, is that hand meaning that you want to say something? I don't think I have a hand up. There's there's a hand over your face right now. No, a hand out. I think she's saying, or up. Yeah, I. That's really weird. It's not showing on my end. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't see it either. That's funny. Wow, I see. Oh, it. You know what it was? <laughs> it was my arrow. Mm -hmm. Evidently, it turns to a a hand. When it, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's gonna be one of those days. Totally oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get the uh, the file right now. Okay. Did everyone receive the um, handout? Yep. Okay. And I did put in the email that I'm going to try to uh, get. There it is. The... Okay, oh. good. Okay, so that does work. Ooh, I did it. <laughs> Do you see it? Everybody see it? I hope so. God, I hope so. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Yay. All right. Woo. So uh, I will. How many of you uh, attended the first meeting? Well, I can't see everybody right now. Um, Well, I think what we're going to do is being that she's got it up. I will continue to let people in as okay. Carol is talking. So um, I would say I'm going to hand it over to Carol. And okay. Hi, everybody. I can't. Oh. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending. And um Oh, this is a, uh, there's a considerable amount of information as you've seen for the people that have had the handout. And again, Valerie, thank you. And Susan's going to be my lifeline too on uh, when it comes to research uh, information resources. 
So uh, as with the handout, there's a lot of information to cover. And as uh, Kathy Catone, Mrs. Kathy Catone had mentioned uh, that part one is recorded. And if you uh, happen to want to see part one, we're gonna try to make that available, you know, as soon as we can, or maybe a couple of days after this uh, meeting tonight, correct, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Our, our IT person had to take a couple of days off and go uh, take care of her dad. Okay. So she should be back pretty soon, and I will have her put it back on for a little bit. I think they've had it on for 30 days. Oh, okay. I, that was new to me, too. So, um, yeah, that would be great. And it's kind of, you'll be able to piece it together, because part one is generally where uh, how finding out late in life affected me. And boy, it was a learning experience as far as learning new terminology, uh, what you can do, what you can't do, you'll, which you'll see, I basically brought some of the elements from the first one into this one, because they do overlap. That's why we've had to do it in two parts. So uh, moving along, uh, just in general, the subject that we're going to cover, as it says right on, on this screenshot, that uh, the impacts of on adoptees and attaining their original birth certificate, also known as OBC, you might see that in different areas. Uh, for tonight's Zoom pre presentation, as of Tuesday, January 9, 2024, 6 30 to 8 p.m. So, again, my name is Carol Bogan. I am what they call a late discovery adoptee, meaning I was never told. I didn't find out until two weeks before my 40th birthday when both my adoptive parents were deceased. So I literally tripped on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that too in mind, with uh, Kathy Catone, who uh, is also a genealogy researcher, her T area is Irish genealogy, which I'm going to be making use of her be it now from my DNA, I've noted noted that I have Irish heritage. So I thought, whoopee, now I can finally celebrate St. Patrick's Day officially. So that was one good benefit. So, uh, so I wish to uh, go through the uh, app, excuse me, the slides. Again, there's a lot of information. I am going to break it up for a Q&A session. If you could please, if you have questions as we go along, just type it in the chat box for uh, Kathy to bring to my attention when we have it. If we don't have any, then we'll continue on. If you want to take a bit of a break, that's fine with me. So we just have to let us know, right, Kathy? Yes. As to when you'd like to take a break. Yes. Okay, on to, are you guys ready for the journey? Okay. Yeah. Just general genial general informational facts about adoption. Uh, mainly, it's the process where people that uh, have children given up for adoption for any re number of reasons at birth, either unwed mothers or they um, can uh, people that can no longer have children of their own decide to adopt. So it's an outlet. And of one of the many different terminology terms that I did learn in this process is called the triad. And I'm thinking that is comprised of the adoptee, the birth parents, and the adoptive parents. So as it states underneath, the reasons for and are not inclusive, if you care to read that, for unwed mothers, as I was mentioning, teenager or adult pregnancies, or it can even be by rape or incest or the birth mother and birth father is unable to financially or emotionally provide for the well-being of a newborn child. Childless couples are, as a result of infertility, pregnancy complications, may also want to decide to adopt. And what's ironic too, that uh, they're finding that adoptees, uh, their birth parents were adoptees at one point also. So it's kind of, it. this is a very interesting but complex 
uh, topic, as I mentioned earlier. So now you decide whether you were, let's take it from the point that someone was told versus someone that is untold about their being adopted. So irregardless of which other uh, framework that you fall into, these are my suggestions. You know, get a notebook, a journal, diary to collect and document your data to be, uh, be they positive or negative results. This way you have when you go back and then someday you want to show maybe your children or others what you went through. Okay, have a close friend or family member you can confide in for emotional support and or understanding as you encounter any unique experiences. What it will be is a true roller coaster. You should be prepared for that because it can be very emotional draining and it's not all roses on the other side of the fence. Obtain your non-identifying information, excuse me, from the known adoption agency or from the state of Michigan, if currently not available or unknown. There is a handout, in the handout, there is a request form to obtain your non-identifying information. And next point of number four, I cannot in stress the importance of documenting your experiences or where you found your information. Should you have to go back and say, well, did I talk to that person? Uh, what did I find out? Do I need to find out more? Was it positive? Was it negative? Should I just maybe stop here, right here and now and not go any further? Maybe wait a couple months. Again, Think of it emotionally, even though as much as you want to find out, as quickly as you want to find out, you still have to be able to take your time. Oops, sorry. Okay, I strongly recommend, like it says, be prepared for the emotional draining. Uh, boy, it was, in my case, not knowing. It hurt because I had... Again, I, I was born in 1947. My adopted father was born in 1901. My adopted mother was born in 1903. So it was like my grandparents raising me. So as of 1987, when I found out, I lost, I had 12 deaths in my family from January 10th of 1968 to January 9th of 1969. Anybody that could have told me anything. So as it states, I strongly recommend purchasing a DNA kit from Ancestry.com. They are the largest known, and I can attest to them, genealogy database and or heritage.com. There are others like Family Search. Uh, they have uh, links that you can go in, and once you get your DNA, you can upload that information to them, or there's DNA Pater. And as Valerie, can I call upon you right now, dear? Yes, Valerie? what you need? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Susan. I'm Hi, Valerie. Uh, Susan. <laughs> okay. Susan? Yes. Okay, with those DNA kits. Yeah. Are there others that you recommend other than uh, uh, the heritage.com or uh, ancestry.com? Um. Okay, so Ancestry.com is the one I would recommend first. If people only have money to test with one place, I would definitely test there because they have the largest database of testers. More testers means more matches for you, means more likely to be able to find birth family. Um, you can upload for free from Ancestry to MyHeritage, to GEDmatch, which is G-E-D-M-A-T-C-H, and to um, family tree DNA. So the only kind of large testing company that doesn't allow an upload from Ancestry is 23andMe. If you are able to, I would also suggest testing with them because a lot of people do test with them. But those are the two big ones, Ancestry and 23andMe, and then upload for free to the other companies. Thank you, dear. You are You're my welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. As Valerie will be shortly too, probably down the road. Okay, Nick, and moving on. Now, 
there are two types of main uh, types of adoptions, be it uh, United in, in the United States. That's why we're saying domestic. There's the agency and the independent adoptions. The agency are, as it states, are your uh, like Catholic social services, your uh, Lutheran services, uh, let's see, or a private agency. Because, no, because they are private, they are governed by the state. So there are guidelines of rules and regulations that they have to follow the licensing standards, procedure standards. Independent adoptions, they're more like your attorneys. But uh, what's a one good thing too, mainly, they are uh, like secondary. People may have already know that there would be a baby being born in the hospital, let's say within two months, or they might be knowing the birth mother personally, where they would, rather than go through an adoption agency, go right to an attorney and set up the paperwork that way. And uh, the one thing with the independent adoptions from the attorneys, they're still, you're safe because they are uh, assured by the being a member of the uh, Michigan State Bar Association or any state, their bar association. So what is really considered to be, what is non-identifying information? It doesn't disclose who the adoptee's biological parents were. By that, I mean, you cannot, you, you won't know, let's say you're going to ask them, okay, I need to know the day, time, and place of my, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I got, okay, the non-identifying information, the adoptee can ask, see, to this day, I still get confused between the two, can ask any question such as the date, time, and place of the adoptee's birth. That's when you, as an adoptee, are requesting from the state or the adoption agency that put forth your adoption, you're able to ask these questions. The health and genetic history of them, including prenatal care, neonatal care, medical, and medication take by the mother during pregnancies. Health and genetic history of the biological parents, including heredity diseases and cause of age of death of any deceased parents. Description of the child's family origin. Let's say, for example, what they try uh, is generally if you were, if your adoptive parents are Catholic, they generally try to have you baptized as Catholic. And at the same time, too, they may go to a Catholic social services organization. They, in turn, the Catholic association. Association, uh, association will uh, release information that is not, in other words, non-identifying. You can ask anything. You cannot ask any to anything totally specific. You could ask the religion of the um, birth parent. You can ask, um, let's see, their, you know, their race, their ethnicity. So what next part is to separate the two, the, uh, what is the identifying information? That would be more specific. That will not be released unless you have a court order. You try to go to the court and you want to know, you petition the court of jurisdiction. By that, I mean the place where the adoption was finalized. As to, I need to know, like in my case, uh, I didn't find out till I was about uh, two weeks before my 40th birthday when I literally tripped upon the concept. Secondly, I did find from the non-identifying information that my biological father was adopted also. I petitioned the Wayne County Court in 1987, paid $100, and was still denied access to my information, which was a real shocker on that end too. So as you can see, the adoptee's birth, uh, birth location, city, state, 
a city hospital midwife, doctor's name, time. The names and addresses of each biological parent at the time. That again would be identifying. The biological parent's full birth dates with locations, full names of any biological siblings or descendants. You can ask, do I have, are there any, uh, do I have any maybe half brothers or sisters? However, it all depends on the birth mother at the time of relinquishment, what she tells the uh, agency that put forth or the attorney that put forth the adoption, how much she knows or how much she cares to release. Okay, now this one here, as of mid-October, this is now an update that uh, at the time I did part one, that was October 3rd. That week, found out, went down to Lansing, where it says House Bill 5148 and 5149 was uh, passed by an overwhelming majority of 99 yes to 8 no for all adoptees to attain their original birth certificate, or again, OBC. And eliminate, we're trying to eliminate the uh, current donut hole that we'll get into in the current uh, Michigan adoption closed record law. We'll go into more detail. And in the meantime, Valerie, can I call on Valerie? Because Valerie was very instrumental, as was um, her organization or Facebook. I strongly suggest going to and joining. It's a private Facebook page. It's called Adoptees Advocate, oh, Adoptees Advocates of Michigan. Valerie? Sure. Um, yeah, the we did pass it through the House, and we're getting ready to go through the Senate this term. So this session, which I believe starts tomorrow. So we are ramping up to advocate for ourselves and our bill again, um, and hopefully get it passed out of the Senate, and then it'll go to the governor, and hopefully she will sign it. So you know, just like Schoolhouse Rock, all the different phases of a bill. <laughs> yes. um, but but we're headed for committee and then we'll be going into the Senate. So, yep. Is that all you needed? Uh, well, in the meantime, too, you want people to maybe consider joining the group, the Facebook page, if they're on Facebook, because the extra well, support. Go ahead. Sure. Yes. And we are actually part of a coalition. So uh, Adoptee Advocates of Michigan. Yeah, we're on Facebook. We also have a website. We're on Instagram. We're on all the social media platforms. So if you just look up Michigan Adoptee or Adoptees Michigan, you'll find something. But we're actually um, one organization of three who is making up a coalition in Michigan uh, to get this legislation passed. So we have national backing as well as another um Michigan-based uh, organization called Michigan Adoptee Collaborative that is more in the west side of the state. But uh, we work with a lot of different organizations. We're trying to get organized. Um, and yeah, we do have a Facebook group. There's always something going I, on. I put a link to the Facebook group, Valerie, in the chat. Yeah, it's also on the handout. It is definitely oh, great. on the handout. And I can put great. it in the chat. I will do that. Oh, I put it there. I'm saying oh, did you? What I'm saying. Awesome. I did. Yeah. It's right Yay. there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, we gotta cover. Susan is on our board and she's an amazing um, search angel and she helps a lot of our members try to figure out first steps because we do have a very complex system in Michigan. We have um, a donut hole. I will let um, Carol tell you more about all of that, but I am definitely here to answer any more questions. Okay. Thank you, my dear. Yeah, oh, one more additional fact too. Uh, tomorrow night, there is um, on January 10th through Gregory Luce, who is a Minnesota uh, adoptee himself and attorney by law that helped with the wording of the uh, House Bill 5148 and 5149 for Michigan. Do you, I can... You don't, uh, can you have any information on that right now, Val? I know Valerie, you'll be on there tonight, uh, tomorrow night. Right. So uh, Greg Luce, he is the executive director of Adoptees United, and he is also president of Adoptees Rights Law Center, and he is a coalition partner. So he wrote our bill. 
um, which is really complicated thing to do. And especially with our system being as complex as it is, there was a lot of different parts to it. Um, and it's actually a, what they call a tie bar bill. So that means it's two bills that both have to pass in order for either one of them to pass. Um, mm -hmm. So we get two sponsors that way. And uh, one of our sponsors is Christian Grant um, out of the Grand Rapids area. And the other is Pat Outman. Um, Grant is a Democrat, Outman is a Republican. So this is a bipartisan package. Um, and we're expecting it to potentially you know, pass this year. Uh, it's looking like it's a good landscape for enacting things like that right now. So we're hopeful. And we will be number sweet 16. Yes. And so the, exactly. We will be the 16th state of 50 to have this law. 15 other states have passed it. Most recently, Minnesota, which is where Greg lives. And um, so when, uh, when records all became closed, it, it wasn't until like the 30s and 40s, uh, up until the 30s and 40s, all adoptees could get their information. This whole secrecy thing is relatively, you know, new um, if, in the span of time. So, uh, yeah, we're hoping that that it will go back to being open again when uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin closed the law there. Uh, Michigan followed suit. You know, we all just kind of copied each other. And New York was around the same time, too. So New York is now an open state for adult adoptees to obtain their original birth certificates. So is Minnesota. As of this summer, uh, they will finally be open. And Wisconsin is working on things. And we are working on things here in Michigan, too. So, yeah, the legislative update is tomorrow night. And that's where yeah. any adoptee can join and hear about what is happening across the country in adoptee rights? There's a lot of different states that have bills. Some of them are good, some of them are not good. Some of them are actually regressive. So anybody who wants to join that is definitely welcome to do so. One other quick question, Bill. The, um, your group, because I'm still fairly a new member, uh, is that, that can be adoptees, birth parents, adoptive parents. Is that correct? Or is it just adoptees? Right. No, we are adoptee advocates of Michigan. So while a large majority of the group members are adopted people, um, there was also birth parents and adoptive parents who support our cause and care about adoptee rights. Um, so anybody is welcome, friends, family, whoever wants to support this for adopted people in Michigan. Thank you, Val, because that's what I, if somebody was just looking at the title adoptees, they might think it's just for adoptees. That's yeah, what I wanted to clarify. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, earlier, after I sent the uh, handout, someone tried to uh, sign up for tomorrow's meeting, and the link did not work. So I don't know. Did you copy and paste it, or did you type it? uh are you talking about i don't think i provided a link for tomorrow night's meeting i just provided links to groups if you're talking about the handout um other than that i don't know is there a meeting later tonight no no this is no. not even a meeting that i am conducting this is a meeting through adoptees united they have these quarterly um zoom free events that you can attend to find out what's going on with adoptee rights across the country so okay i'll go back to my email on my phone and while you guys are talking see if i can figure out which which link it was okay that'd be great yeah okay. all right i'm gonna mute myself are you all set with me carol i'd hate to interrupt your presentation oh no no you're not interrupting at all believe me i just happen to think of it because just going by the title uh, some that are here today might think, oh, it's just adoptees only type deal. No, it's anybody anybody who supports adoptee and us having uh, rights to our own information. Um, we basically believe that adopted people, once they're an adult, have a right to know where they come from. And the laws should support that. Um, many adopted people, all different ages, are having all kinds of problems with mm -hmm issues like obtaining a passport or getting this new real ID. We've had some have issues, uh, which that's going to be required uh, to fly, I think in 2025. So um, 
And beyond that, you know, having a copy of your original birth certificate is just a right that every human should have of that first document that says that they're alive. And, and, and we want to have accurate information once we're adults um, that we shouldn't be protected from that. So that is our belief. And if others can support that, then they are very welcome to join us to try to get that enacted. Right. I hope they do. And by going to your site that you will, they will see the Lansing information. There's a videotape of that. There's, there's a lot, there's a world of information on that. Um, right. Well, and we also have a public page that we're directing people to is actually the coalition page. Oh. Uh, Adopt the Advocates of Michigan is just a private group on Facebook, but the coalition page is actually um, representative of all of our groups coming together. And um, I think I put the website for that and the Facebook page and any yes, other. You did. Okay, super. Okay, thank you, my dear. Sure. Stand by both of you yet. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, moving on. Did you happen to find anything, uh, Kathy, you were mentioning or the link or something? I'm still looking. Oh, oh wait a minute. Here it is. No, this is. No, not yet. Okay, that's all right. Okay, now, what effect can it have, the effect on the adoption triad? Again, you're going to, it's the terminology that adoptees learn over time from day one pretty much like I did myself and especially when people would say you know your mother and I was because I was split and during the time of learning it I would say well which one you know it was it was this tennis match in my head that I always had to play and try to decipher what people were saying so the biological pa uh, birth parent mainly the birth mother she as I found out through when I did meet my birth mother, and she lives in California at the time, that the guilt and shame that they carried, again, because for that time period, being, again, I said I was born in 1947 and she was born in 1929, that and being Catholic and the my biological father, Again, himself being adopted and being a Protestant. So religious-wise, that wasn't a cool thing. She was really shunned and uh, shamed. So uh, the other uh, thing with the birth biological parent, a birth parent, merely this is information from the birth mother that I have gathered from how my birth mother felt and it, over time, I discovered how that seemed to be a common thread with birth mothers, that uh, they may have tried to keep the newborn child by having a sibling or family member adopt so she could still have an indirect contact with the child. In my case, uh, I did find out that my birth mother came from a family of nine. So as I mentioned earlier, on one end, on the adopted end, I lost 12 family relatives in one year to the day. And then all of a sudden, again, part of this tennis match, now I come from a family of nine. I have all these aunts and uncles that I lost, you know, <laughs> knowing prior years it's since 60, 1968, 69. So she, my birth mother, her name was Margaret uh, Nowicki Wilson. And at the time, uh, she wanted her sister, Virginia Marie, who I am named after, to possibly adopt me because she, her, her uh, sister, Virginia Marie, could not have any children. Thought, wow, that's the perfect setup. So what happened <laughs> just, oh, about two weeks before the signature was supposed to be and the ink had not dried on the paper, my aunt, uh, Virginia Marie, my mother's sister, that uh, mentioned, oh, by the way, and she couldn't get pregnant. Ironically, she found out she got pregnant. So when Nadine was born, who was would have been technically my cousin, maybe possibly half sister at the time, I said, oh, that's going to be interesting. How are we going to express how you're four months younger than me? You know, you've heard of twins being a couple hours different, but not it's kids being uh, 
four or five months difference in age from the same mother. So the other thing too, back then, this is the archaic time period, meaning uh, the social mores back then where everything was swept under the carpet. The birth mother was told not to look for this child ever. Don't even think of it because you're giving up a baby for adoption and it's the best thing you could have done for the kid. It's future, which most likely was at the time. But the way they stressed and em emphasized thinking that all what she went through for nine months and then all of a sudden it's like it never happened according to them on paper. That's where the guilt came in. Did I make the right decision even though there had to be some way I could keep her, meaning me. Okay, a lot of birth mothers hope secretly in their heart that the child, once it becomes an adult, would search and hopefully reunite for her to have that personal closure. My birth mother, had, Margaret, had told me that uh, she, this was a phrase, exact, a statement right from her. In fact, she told me on my birthday that she used to light every birthday from the time she gave me up, she went in the church and lit a candle for me in the hopes of me finding her, even though I was in Michigan, born in Michigan, and she's out in California, which doesn't help either, you know. So, and then a lot of times she also told me and wondering, you know, is she, am I alive? Is the, is the child that I gave up, are they alive? Are they dead? Do they even want to... Do they have any children now? Do they even want to think of looking for me? Maybe I did. It's just their internal restlessness was um, just continues, it seems like, until that they can get some type of closure. But then again, depending on the situation, maybe uh, the birth mother was raped, so that, or incest. So for sure, it's way down the road, or perhaps she hadn't even told her own family that she had a baby and had to give it up for adoption. So she carries that extra load. Okay, the adoptive parents. Most likely back then, and I think currently, but then the records back then, because they were closed, that now versus current day, it's more of an open adoption where there's more of a communication. The mother, by that I mean the birth mother, might put a letter that the adoptive parent can give the child when they're older, uh, to, or they might have an open communication just like when someone's divorced that they have a visitation right. That can, you know, that's generally worked out between the adopted family and the birth family for current day issue, that is. <clears throat> so um, back then, most likely if they were told no further contact with the biological parents would be made at the time of relinquishment, that way, gee, there's no fear. The adoptee will never search or leave it, leave. The child will never leave the adoptive parent if they decide to search because there's no reason to. They might have been told that, oh, their birth mother died at the time and they're, you know, they were born. They were left in a basket on the doorstep. They didn't want you. All kinds of sad secrecy back then. But with the DNA, and I know Susan can attest to this, that a lot of it is now you can hide it under the carpet, but you can't totally sweep it under the carpet. It'll, it will surface one way or another. Unfortunately, the longer that these adoptive parents don't tell their child, the harder it is over time and the more effects that will have of shock, it mistrust onto the adoptee. And I attest to that again because I uh, it happened to me and my adopted mother had at that time in 1947 swe have all the family members swear in a Bible never to reveal that I was adopted. 
So even if they wanted to tell me, they couldn't. When my birth, when my adopted mother died in 1981, I even went to a priest being brought up a strict Catholic and asked him, well, I know she's, she's deceased and I know, you know, that should release anybody that still be around from that vow. He said, nope, can't do it. So on one hand, here I had the government, my adopted mother, the government, and the religion saying, no, you're not entitled to anything. Like tough rocks. That's my That was my personal feelings at the time. But overall, I do applaud the adopted parents that had the courage and the insight to tell the adoptee the truth at an early age. Thus, they will gain and keep trust and they'll even have greater love for that adoptive parent because they were truthful with them as opposed to not telling them anything at all now any questions we have you're uh you're muted kathy katone you're muted you're muted kathy unmute Oh no. Kathy. I know. I was trying to get to it, Carol. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. Okay. That's oh, okay. Okay. Um, yes, we do have looks like some questions in chat. And oh, I just lost the the message was from Lori uh Roush. Are you here? Okay, then we will. Yes, I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you had sent, you had asked about, uh, when you asked about a link to the seminar, was that this seminar? Yes, ma'am. It was this one. Oh, um, because, okay. Well, good, tried, Lori, you made it. All right. Yeah, when I tried to click on it, it wouldn't work. So I thought, let me copy and paste it. And I did that and it was absolutely fine. I didn't have any problem. Good. All right. Okay. Um, chats. Do, 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 do. Lori, are you the Lori that asked me in an email that your grandfather, born 1905, are you the same Lori? Yes. Oh, yes. good, good. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, it was just really interesting because his last name was Kendall. And my granddaughter did one of those ancestry DNA kits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it came back that my grandfather was a hundred percent Ashkenazi Jew. Well, we never knew that. So now I really would like to find out, you know, what his name was before he was adopted and um, just to get more family history. Okay. Now, do you have, let's see. Susan, Susan, you can buy Susan. Yep, I missed the question. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, uh, did you happen to hear what Lori asked? No, that's what I'm saying. I missed the question. Sorry, Lori. Go ahead. Um, yeah, basically, what I said. My grandfather was born and adopted in 1905, and right. um. Of course, I tried to get his birth certificate from the state of Michigan. I couldn't get it. But through Ancestry DNA, we found out that he actually was 100% Jewish. And we had no idea. So okay. that's why I'm really trying to get his original birth certificate. Well, I mean, I, I would have to look that up. But my inclination is to say because of the length of time, uh, it's been since he was born, and and the fact that you're a direct descendant, that you would be mm -hmm. able to get that. So would I petition the court for that, or would I write to like the uh, vital statistics and I, um? I would write. I would write to vital records. I don't think this is okay. a matter where you have to petition. Yeah. Okay. All All right. Right. I will do that. Oh. Okay, Lori, hang on. That <laughs> being it's a hundred years old, like his. Not his original birth certificate, but where, what city do you know where he was born? No, I we, I know that he was born somewhere around Saginaw, but I don't know. And I mean, it's really weird because my on my mother's side, our family history is so strange. 
and what my mother was told and things like that was completely untrue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. so for with my, I mean, I know the name of my grandfather's adoptive parents. I know that, but I don't know what, who is original, you know, who is mother. Well, all I know is the mom was not married oh, and my mother had a couple different last names, but it's not gotten me anywhere. So I'm, I mean, I'm hoping I can get a copy of his original birth certificate okay, so that one, it'll give me more information. Okay. The one thing with her not being wed, his mm -hmm. last name, even though it, it, she didn't give him a first name, his last name, let's say she didn't give him a first name. His, right. his name on the record, the original birth certificate would say, maybe baby boy, and then her last name would mm -hmm. be, the baby's last name would be the maiden name of the birth mother. Okay? Yes. She was unmarried. Yeah. So then if it was Saginaw, I would still, there's the application in that hand. You did, when you get a handout or did you, no, I don't think you got a handout. Did you? No, I did not. Okay. Well, um, Kathy will be sending, you know, sending you the handout or I can send her the handout. Let, let me put that, it in the chat. Okay. So in that uh, handout is a form where you can request. Okay. Uh, I would say, you know, for identifying information, there's one for non-identifying information and there's one for identifying information. And the one for identifying is a fillable application that you can do right online and print it out and send it to them. They're, oh, they're, okay, good. So because b and uh, Susan, I think that would be right, correct? Yes, that sounds right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. being it's 100 years old, so... You know, yeah. that would cut right to the chase, but it has on there, you know, the things that you would be able to fill out and your and descendants, you know, your, you know, death records, they, there is no right to privacy. Right. Okay? And especially after a hundred years, for sure, there yeah. is no right to privacy. Right. So you should be able to keep, you know, keep me in touch too. Okay. Oh, definitely. Okay. And then between the, you know, the three of us and uh, with Susan's help too, may, you know, we'll, We'll do. I love doing those older ones because I do the genealogy part, and I have different okay. databases that I uh, I work with. Okay, so yeah. that should be an or you know like uh, Susan was mentioning maybe the DNA information the two of you could hook together and then maybe okay. she could see other things that maybe you not might not be uh, knowing at the time that you're looking. And there's so much data out there. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the information and I'm definitely going to check into it. Good. And I'm so glad you got, you got in. I know I tried to squeeze yeah. in. <laughs> I made it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> okay. Next one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Doreen says hi. She's from Monroe, Michigan. And oh, hi, her grandfather was from Fort Huron. Yeah. Yay. Oh, he was. Okay. Um. Then we have, oh, here's the link to the Adoptee Associates of Michigan. So that's in the chat. Okay, good. Uh, when I get done reading the questions, I'll go back to my email and download uh, today's handout. Okay, good, okay, good. Okay, let's do, well, oh, I can never tell if I've skipped anybody. I don't know how to gradually do this without skipping um okay that's talking about the link um now somebody's answering adrian's question but her question is further down so uh, okay we'll come back to the answer that adrian's oh oh see i know i just skipped somebody uh doreen carol will likely get into this further the what? Oh, this isn't this isn't going well. Uh, Doreen, what is? Must Doreen? Be, they must. Somebody must have asked a question, and Doreen answered. Oh, okay. Um, let's
right. To move it all. Oh, here we go with the slider. All right. To Adrian's question because they've been asking and answering hers. There's Adrian's. Okay. Adrian had a cousin who was adopted and his parents are deceased. Hmm. There are no siblings. Could I, as a relative, request his uh, OBC if the bill passes? Well, that and how old is this person now? What's their birth birth year or birth date now, especially? Well, he's deceased, but he was born around 1945. Well, he's deceased, the adoptees. He's, de he's deceased. Parents are deceased. There were no siblings. He wasn't married and didn't have children. So you would like to get his... Um... Original birth certificate. Okay. He falls right into what we call, adoptees call, the donut hole. Oh, that's the donut hole. I wondered that what is, it was. I kept, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people that like donuts, you know, like Dunkin' Donuts, you know, they take, no, Tim, Tim Bits, no. <laughs> what that is, is anyone that was adopted, not so much their birth date. This is when their adoption was finalized. No, can I have the, his birth date again, please? Yeah, I think I'm going to check. I think it was... 1945 um okay. this bringing is bringing up my trio look okay because this is what's important the donut hole era again as uh valerie was saying the the other states came up with it after like 1939 and other states uh, decided to join the bandwagon and said for that time where for michigan the donut hole era is anyone that had their parental rights terminated not meaning their birth date per se it's when the signature it was finalized in court that the uh the relinquishment was given up and the adoptee's parents now are the legal parents that went from may oh i know this by date but may 28th 1945 to September 12th, 1980. Now, sad if someone had their, prior to that, they're pretty much open. I need uh, either Sue or Val to jump in on this one. I want to make sure they're pretty much open unless there is a denial on file, but this person now is deceased that you're mentioning uh and adrian that yes. um or can you the person that was uh their parental rights or the, i mean the the adoption was finalized let's say september 13th 1980 you see the discriminatory factor with those dates that leaves out anybody you know that's quite that's quite a <laughs> an era to cover but so back then it's because of the social morals were the way they were at that time. Now, because the way I say now, the way the social mores, morals are, you have unwed mothers having baby showers, having gender reveal showers, things of this nature. I mean, those people that had children during that time period, the free love period, and even post-World War II babies, which I was a part of, they call the baby boom era that they'd be rolling in their graves right now to see that happening. So go ahead, uh, Adrian, you have that information? Oh, yeah, actually, it's uh, April 1951. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm getting, I was getting him confused with it. A, a oh, that, cousin, that's, so. it's more fun on this end, hon, believe me, it really <laughs> is. So Adrian, correct on that, and Susan? Uh, well, basically, if, if if the person is relinquished, that means that they are given up for adoption during mm -hmm. 45 to 1980. 
Mm -hmm. Those people, in order to obtain a copy of their original birth certificate, have to get a court order and see a judge. So it doesn't matter if you are the offspring of those people or anything until it's like, I think, 100 years or something like that. 75 years. It's a really long time. So you would need to get a court order from a judge. And unfortunately, not all judges feel that, that everybody should have that information. So you, it just depends on the county you're in and the judge that you talk to. You don't know what you're going to get. That's my best answer. So I, I am not sure. If, I believe it was in Detroit, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Okay. There is a lot of secrecy. I know the name of the doctor who handled the adoption. Um, but the doctor, would I? I'm sorry. I'm yes, sorry. Did I, you see the doctor that handled the adoption? Yes. Wow. Um, yeah, my aunt uh, went to see him about fertility issues, and he mm -hmm. said, "Well, I have this girl who's expecting a baby, and." she's an alcoholic and we don't know how the baby's going to turn mm -hmm. out. Do you want it? And she said, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that's familiar. And, uh, <laughs> that was, that was that. And then nobody talked about it. Um, mm -hmm. So would I then assuming it was handled in Detroit, would I, do I still go, do I go to Lansing? Where would I go? Okay. You know, Honestly, okay. Susan is going to be the best person to handle this information because this is what she's put like 200 families together with their <laughs> biological um, uh, so. relatives. So, yeah, she is really good. And Wayne County, uh, I think you even know the people down there, don't you, Susan? Yeah, yeah, you know, I do yeah. actually. Yeah, so she would I, have great advice. I would contact uh, Latrice Ross at the Wayne County Probate Court. She's she I think is the only person handling Wayne County. So even though, you know, she she does a great job, but she can get kind of backlogged. But she's also very pleasant. If you call her on the phone, if you uh, send me a message or give me your email address, I can get you her phone number. Okay. I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> OK, um, can I just give you my email address? right Sure. Now? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. OK. Ready. All right, it's uh, A. Kaufman, so A K A U F M A N okay. at Comcast.net. Okay. All right, I will send you information about Latrice Ross, and she's the person to talk to at Wayne County. All right, you thank you very nice. much. Yeah, you're I welcome. Can I can attest to Wayne County. When I went before the Wayne County uh, court judge, the probate judge is the juvenile division of the probate. When I went before her, and I thought at that time in 1987, being that I was uh, a late discovery adoptee and that my biological father was adopted also, being I had no true medical history, uh, you have to present a valid reason. Just wanting to know is not, it's not going to cut it with them. I'll just put it in plain, you know, plain terms. So after I got done presenting my side of the story as to my reason, the judge took her gavel and hit it and looked at me and said, denied, next. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget <laughs> standing there. I had paid $100, took the day off work, and I'm thinking, okay. Then she just went next. So it all depends, again, You've got to think back in terms of that time period. Now that 50 years practically has passed, 40 to 50 years, things are a little different. And even if you went, like, say, at my age, like I'm 76, I'm still denied my original birth certificate. Okay? Because if there is a denial on file, which I have to end my spare time, figure out, let them, you know, tell me if there's denial. Because I did I did find my biological parents, which you'll see in the next couple slides, on my own. Good old gumshoe detective, no computer, in 1987 to 1995, okay? So <laughs> that um, has got me more going strong to get these people that's my bucket list to get my original birth certificate okay i like to have it in my hands 
I know I'm real now because I did meet my biological parents, but it's the paperwork that makes it legit for me. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pausing on that. It's just I'm reflecting at the time. But it hurt. It was just uh, from one traumatic incident to another. It just kept going on and on and on. So when's this going to end? So I am so pleased to be a part of this group and find out that finally something is going to be done and hopefully that it will pass for all adoptees to get their original birth certificate. Doesn't matter what year, especially it's up to them. Do they want it or they don't? And when you want it, you know, be nice to have. So that, is that okay, next question. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I have reflecting. I have a, a Kathleen in the room with me and she would like to ask the question. Okay, go ahead. Hello, yes. Um, I'm looking, my brother uh, had a set of twins, which I'm not sure. Uh, I believe it would have been probably 1958. He would have been maybe 16, but it's in Flint. So Genesee County, how would you do that when he's already dead? How would I go about doing that? Because he's dead and I don't think, I don't know anything where the mother is. Do I have a chance in trying to get that birth record? Huh. Oh, I don't think so at this point. But what no. I think um, I would suggest, this is just my opinion. And then I think, you know, if Valerie or um, Susan can chime in on this to make sure I'm on the right track, I would still approach or have something in writing. You you don't know for sure the county of jurisdiction where the adoption took place, right? Yeah. Oh, oh you do know. County. Pardon. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Genesee County. Yeah, you did yeah. say that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, I'm 76. I got a good reason for being. <laughs> no, um, Genesee County. I would contact the Genesee County Juvenile Court and mention to them that you would like to be on file. To you know, is there a form you can fill out, or just write a letter as to who you are? Should um, anything? Wait a minute. Um, am I approaching this right? Let me see. Wait, he's deceased, right? Yes, he's deceased. The two adopted for yeah for his twins. Most likely, they try to keep them together with twins. They very rarely separate them. Right. Um. Mm -hmm. Val, what do you, or Sue, what do you think? I think I would write a let, you know, contact the Genesee County uh, Juvenile Court and talk to the adoption section and see about, you know, presenting the facts which she knows to be uh, current and maybe send a let with that within that letter that she would like to be contacted in the meantime before the, um, so that way it's set up if it goes through with the original birth certificate and if one of those twins decides to look for, you know, the birth mother or even a sibling of the, uh, the father. Am I saying it correct? You know what I'm following? Okay. Yeah. I, I wouldn't mind pitching in on that one. So you're yeah, saying go ahead. That the twins, the twins were relinquished for adoption, but the parent has passed on, correct? Yes. The okay. Passed, I don't know anything about the mother. Okay, so typically, um, you know, nine times out of 10, uh, the father's name is left off of the birth certificate. Unless they are married by law, they typically will leave the father's name off because that's just another person that they're going to have to get permission of in order to uh, put the baby into an adopted home. So they will just put the birth mother's name on there. That being said, um, they would still be able to find family through DNA if you have your DNA uploaded. Right, and exactly. also uh, a family member of this birth father can always contact the state. That would be the car department. And Susan, you'll have to tell me what your thought, cause she might have a whole different idea on this and she's really, she really knows what she's talking about. But, um, you know, I would let them know ahead of time that, hey, our family does want to meet this adoptee. Um, if our bill is enacted and becomes law, one of the parts of it will provide a contact preference form so that when the adoptee does try to get a 
copy of their original birth certificate. Um, it gives the opportunity for the birth parent and potentially the birth parent's family. I'm not exactly sure if they will incorporate that or not, but hopefully to be able to say, yes, we'd like to meet you or no, you know, um, nobody knows about you. And it would be, we would prefer to not have any contact. And so that will give families the opportunity to, you know, make that uh, request known so that that way adoptees don't necessarily go through the DNA route um, and they have a little bit of information before they just start knocking on doors type of a thing. So mm -hmm. I hope why that- Why would they leave the father off? If he's a birth father, why would they not put him on the record? Right. Well, that's just standard practice in adoption. Oh. Again, oh. because uh, typically in the state of Michigan, I don't believe you have, you are required to put a father's name on the birth certificate if you're not mm -hmm. legally married. And if you are legally married and it's not the father, his name is going to be what goes on the birth certificate, right. believe okay. it or not, whether he's biologically related or not. So it's just kind of uh, standard practice, but agencies uh, back in the day, we kind of told uh, birth parent, you know, we will take some information about the birth dad, but it'd be better if we kept him out of the loop because then that way nobody can try to claim parental rights um, and we can get your baby into an oh. adopted home. Does that make okay, sense? Thank you. Sure. And Susan, if you have anything to add. I think the only thing I would add is to do the twins, does your brother, I'm sorry, your deceased brother, sorry about your loss. Um, yeah, does he way. have any other children? Yes, he does have other children. He has two oh. of them, but they weren't willing to do a DNA They're, test. Okay, now you could do DNA test. You, you would oh. be able to, if they are out there, if they have tested, you will match them. So it is helpful for you to go ahead and do a mm -hmm. DNA test. And then, like I said earlier, upload to all of them, GEDmatch, Family Tree DNA, and uh, okay. MyHeritage. Um, but as far as, you know, really placing information on file and that kind of thing, it's kind of trickier when you're not a direct descendant or a parent of, but you're a, an aunt or uncle of, it's not quite the same. I would say definitely do a DNA. And I would say that the confidential intermediary program is also available, but that again would not be available, I don't believe, to you. Okay. Um, but to his other children, yes, they would be able to contact the state of Michigan. There is a charge for that, it's about $300. Um, I don't know that it's always 100% successful, but it has worked. And basically, the intermediary opens the adoption file, looks for the birth, you know, for the adoptees contacts them says do you want contact and if yes then they exchange contact information so that's another option kind of unique to michigan okay thank you thank you okay kathy are there yeah. more questions because i just want to go on a little further or can we hold well, on to them you know it's it's really hard for me to tell because some people are answering other people oh here how okay. about if we do this? Um, how about if we ask if there's anybody that has a question before she goes on? If right. You, Thank you. Uh, unmute yourself and just ask the question. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. And this is for Carol. Carol, when you met your biological parents, did you ask them what your uh, birth name was when you were born? Well, when I found my uh, birth mother in California, that's going to be in the next couple slides. You'll see that. Uh, that, yes, she did name me. And in the, what they call, when I requested my non-identifying information, I did get information on her and on my biological father. When I met her, she mentioned, gave me his name, which confirmed information that I suspected with through an obtaining initials by uh, what they call a, uh, well, kind of not really deceptive, but they call, I played a cagey game with the, <laughs> with the government. Okay. You know, by playing dumb, I found out more information. Gee, I didn't know that, you know, but indirectly I do. And it got to them to spill more because again, like I was saying, I did this in 1987. 
when there was no computers. It was just gumshoe detective and just uh, running on gut intuition. Okay, I was wondering because somebody I knew found out exactly who her birth parents were mm -hmm. and her name that was given to her at birth. She went to the place she was born at, the county, yep. and applied for the birth certificate and she got it. Oh. And they didn't know that she was adopted, but she got the birth, the original birth certificate with all the information. That's because she had the name. Okay. I didn't have a name until after I met my birth mother. But by having that name, that can help confirm other later information that I got through the DNA. Okay. Well, she did have her um, adoptive parents' name when she did all this because uh, she had the names of the, uh, you know, the adoptive parents and she had that birth name, but somehow I guess she went and said that, that, um, she'd been married at the time or no, she wasn't married, but oops, I forget what she had said to him, but they actually, they actually gave her the birth certificate right ah. there and didn't have any questions about no adoptions or anything. And uh -huh. she she uh -oh. used her name that she had on the birth certificate. Uh-huh. So they accidentally gave it to her. So. Our, okay. our birth okay. certificates of adoptees um, flagged in any way so that the workers would know. Good question. Indirectly, they are because it'll say amended. It'll say birth. Wait a minute. Registration of birth. On a uh, non-adoptees, it will say somewhere in there, it will say live birth. Also, how I got tipped off when I went to get my uh, birth certificate at the time in 1987, that you'll see on this upcoming slide what I'm talking about, how I was tipped off to begin with. And I'll take you through that process as much, you know, from step one, from step A to, to pretty much when I found her and yeah. him. And I found them both. Okay. So give me, go ahead, hon. Anybody else have anything? Somebody's got their hand up. I don't see the name. I have a question. Oh. I do. Uh, I don't know. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sue, Hello. Are, are you talking to me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I got my birth certificate. Um... And it was back in 1978 when I found out I was adopted. I was in my 20s. Uh, oh, okay. And I did not want to, and I was adopted in Wayne County, been born in Wayne County, but I knew the city that I was born in. And I, I lied quite often because I was determined <laughs> to get my information. I didn't care. Um, and I wrote to the city, which was Garden City. I told them my birth date. And a couple versions of the last name, which I thought it was. I didn't know how it was spelled. And they sent it to me. Oh. And I was lucky because uh -huh. obviously they were not supposed to. But you can always hope for a clerk that doesn't know what they're doing. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I'm yeah, going to go into that too. I like so that. If we could, we're on a little bit of a time constraint, right, Kathy? Because. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just want to, if I, uh, I'd like to go on because I'm going to, it's a twofold as we go into where we're at. And then I try to overlap as I've been doing with uh, current day to bring you up to date. So I'm going to take you a little bit back in time and then we're going to come forward again. Okay. okay. Everybody mute themselves, please. Okay. So. To search or not to search, that is the question. So there are general main reasons why adoptees want to search. They either want to search for the answers they need to know directly from the biological parents, especially the mother, the why, the how, the what if factors or reasons for their relinquishment decisions. The adoptee is on an internal search constantly for the truth. That's why I said going back that you want to have the energy be, you know, it's, uh, have someone that you can confide in, a friend, <laughs> close relative that you can confide in to help share 
uh, and keep reserve a ener lot of energy in reserve because I'm telling you, it is a total emotional roller coaster, being that you don't know really the situation. You know, all these different variables are floating in your head. Why? You know, like I said, with the why, what, when, for. And until you find out exactly, it's just, you're restless. You're constantly restless. Your mind is on overdrive. So moving along, family medical history. That, how many times that you go in and the doctor will say, well, you know, and you fill out the form and your parents and, you know, your grandparents. From, from 1987, I would tell the doctor, I said, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? I said, my, I'm adopted, I just found out, and my biological father's adopted. I have no, I have no idea. I said, right now, I'm healthy. That's what I hope to stay at 40 still. And I don't know what down the road, maybe what I could be preventing, but I'd like to. Or if the another factor is if the child, if the adoptee, excuse me, is of childbearing age, they may want to know so any conditions that they may have. So if they decide to have kids, am I passing uh, diabetes on to them, heart conditions, uh, any, you know, like maybe sickle cell anemia or uh, what's another one? Lupus is a uh, was a common one back then in the 80s. Genetic resemblance. The sense of self factor to another person can help one feel connected to the world, that they belong versus a sense of alienation when there is no shared physical attribute, such as eye or skin color. Again, I'm going to float back and forth bringing up my situation. In my situation, uh, my adopted father had blue eyes. My mother had what they call Elizabeth Taylor velvet blue velvet looking eyes. My brother, who I was raised with, who is an eight years older than me, he has blue eyes. My eye color is hazel brown. Okay. Uh, the, uh, my skin color, I am, uh, I have a lot of, uh, what do you call it? They were very fair complected, of course, because of the, the blue eyes. I have a lot of olive in my complexion. So again, in my case, when you asked because of the age difference, as I mentioned earlier, it was like my grandparents raising me and I was brought up strict Catholic, that the best way I can describe it, if they said one and one is three, it was three. It wasn't two. You do not argue. You accept. That's the way things are and that's the way it is. The adopting also may want to know their true ethnic heritage between extended family members, such as sibling, aunts, uncles, and grandparents, which is nice. As I mentioned earlier, I found out that I'm, I have a percentage of Irish. I thought, oh, great, I can celebrate St. Patrick's Day officially. And do I have any uh, half brothers or half sisters? Yes, I do. I have uh, two half brothers that are now deceased because of heart conditions. They died recently. I have on the, that was on the uh, birth mother's side, on the uh, biological father's side, I have a half sister that passed. Uh, her name was Laura. She died of an overdose. I tried to say, you know, once I found her, I met her. I tried to help her out, but it was, it, she was like in her 40s at the time also, and it was just, uh, couldn't do it, but I tried. So I do have, once I met them, I was able to find that out, even though I don't have, didn't have the actual birth certificate that could have saved me at least 30 to 40 years, and time was not on my side when I found out in 87 that I had to hurry up and try to find them and get whatever information I could. Okay. okay, the research process I develop in my journey, the truth as a never told late discovery. Okay, now again, part of it, as I mentioned just now, that my main reason for wanting to know is because number one, I was never told. Number two, my biological father was adopted also. 
And my reason for getting my birth certificate, going back to your, you know, your earlier, someone's earlier question, that I wanted to know the time that I was born. Back in the 80s, the big thing was get your horoscope done. Well, I'm 40, so I'm half life. I'm halfway through my life cycle. I would find, gee, what's what's being predicted for me? Well, when I went to uh, Wayne County Court, it wasn't there. And for Detroit, I was I knew I was born in Detroit and I was raised in Detroit. But that does not necessarily always hold true for a lot of uh, adoptees. If they were born, let's say, in Detroit, but the adoptive parents might have lived in another county, say, like Macomb or Oakland, a good chance that is where the adoption was finalized, where the adoptive parents reside. That would be like one clue. So then at that time in 1987, when I went down to Wayne County Clerk downtown, and it wasn't there, I said, well, where is it? They sent me to Herman Kiefer Hospital because they divided up uh, the birth and the death records for Detroit and send it over to Herman Kiefer Hospital because of the work overload. So I went there and the gentleman said, no, I'm sorry, you're not here. I said, okay, now wait a minute. I said, you hear about these people going before a judge to prove they're alive. Now I, now I really got to have my birth certificate. So I asked him, I said, now what do I do? And he said, okay, you got to fill this form out. I said, and send it to the state. I goes, well, how long is that going to take? Oh, anywhere between eight to 12 weeks. I said, really? I got in my car and the next day I drove down to Lansing. So when I got my quote unquote birth certificate, it was the size of a four by six piece of paper. At the bottom of the paper was a finalization date of two years, almost two years later. That's what tipped me off because I saw the gentleman before while I was waiting in line that was born the same year I was two weeks prior to in 1947. He was born in August, the end of August of uh, 1947. He had the legal form. It had the day, the time he was born, the doctor, the hospital, the place of birth for father and mother. On mine, that little four by six piece of paper had father's name. Yeah, that was right. Birthplace of father, unknown. Mother's name, birthplace of mother, unknown. I'm going, what the heck is this? You know, so I asked the gal and I said, uh, I said, is this how, you know, I said, this is just this little piece of paper I get. And she goes, oh, yeah, that's how they did things back then. It was meant for me to see that gentleman's birth certificate. Okay. So she turned uh, the phrase. It was like from that moment on, there was like somebody sitting on my shoulder that whispered in my ear, said to ask her that I asked her. And I honest to God to this day, how it came out of my mouth, I still don't know. That I asked her, I said, would I get this form if I was adopted? She was a very fair complected lady with uh, blonde hair. And she turned 80,000 shades of red. I looked <laughs> at her and I said, oh, you just answered my question. Thank you. So now I'm driving home from Lansing. I'm going, who the heck am I going to ask to confirm this? Because I mentioned earlier, I had those 12 deaths. Well, here we go. I'll be going into that. Okay, so how do you start looking when you don't have any information? What I did at that time, I was living in Macomb County. I contacted the Roseville Library, and they at that time there was an agent, an agency for adoptees, and what they that's where I learned the term the triad, again for adoptee, birth parents, biological parents. It was called AIM. It was called I Identity AIM equals I Adoption Identity Movement. It's now no longer in existence. I, it's A lot of them have gone defunct, but I guess through time, uh, a lot more people are going online, like say Facebook pages that I'm finding, to get more immediate answers. At that time that I joined in October, of 1987, the group. That day, there was a woman on the board. She said, I wear two hats. I am an adoptee and an adoptive parent. 
And I told her, I said, hey, I just found out at 40. She goes, she started, she said, you think that's bad? She said, I just found out in uh, when I went down to get my social security when I turned 65 because she turned in the form, like I said, that small little piece of paper that I had was given. She turned that in as always she thought that is her quote unquote birth certificate. The uh, gal, the secretary said, from the uh, social, uh, the uh, social security department said, that's your adoption. I need your actual birth certificate. She goes, what are you talking about? She found out at 65. Okay. So, and then she still was not entitled to her original birth certificate. So what I did, I thought, okay. And they told me, as I said earlier, that I did contact the Wayne County Juvenile Court for my non-identifying information that the advice that AIM gave me. You can always request your non-identifying information. Mine came just before Christmas. So again, as I've been stating that it's when you're an, to an adoptee, you learn a whole new form of communication of terminology and it's a tennis match in your head and then you're trying to sort out sort it all out and then you say well wait a minute whoa sometimes you got to stop and then pick up the pieces but it it can be so overwhelming so when i read my non-identifying information this is what i was able to put out i mean receive i'm sorry so the birth date was correct the weight was seven pounds, 14 ounces. I was told by my adopted mother when I one time asked her, when was I born? I mean, how much did I weigh? She said, oh, you were such a tiny little thing. You weighed only barely five pounds. I thought, okay. So uh, that's a lot far cry from what I saw in, in, uh, on paper. So from what I was given, this information, you'll see, it gave me clues. You have to look at it and then, you know, put it aside and then say, okay, I know this non-identifying information. I've got this. Now what do I do? So this is my approach. These are suggestions I'm going to tell you. So I learned how to comprise a family tree. That's what the Roseville Library told me. Well, let's help you with a family tree because even though I didn't have names, I'm going to start with my adopted family because I never met any of my adopted father's family. Thinking that maybe one of his relatives might have, you know, adopted me because that was very common practice back then because of the post-war baby boom. So uh, at that time, what was available was the 1900, the 1910, and the 1920 census. So when I did, I looked him up and I found him. I found, I knew his adopted, uh, my adopted grandparents on my father's side. So I'm seeing these names, Jadwiga, Hedwig, Ida. I thought, oh my God, he had all these sisters. And then I'm thinking, wow, what happened? I never met them. Well, it turns out they're all the same because they became Americanized for the name Helen. So I thought, okay, this is what I strongly suggest to everyone. Once you receive the non-identifying information, if it starts with uh, anything on the birth mother's end, as far as giving an idea of how she, how old she was at the time, you were born you create a timeline and you form that with and then you start plugging in say okay i know that she was born uh she was 17 years old at the time i was born in 1947 so here it is again um so what I did, I would say, okay, I can figure it out. She was born in 47. I was born in 47. So she had to be born. I was born September 4th, 1947. So for her to be 17 or going into 18, she had to be born somewhere between September 3rd, 1928 to, I mean, uh, September 4th, 
1929, based on her being born in 29 and 18 years old at the time. The birth city was not given because, again, that's considered identifying information. When I started to do doing the genealogy, I found out that the Wayne County Legal News is on microfilm down at the library. So as I have it here, I started looking for, it had it separated, boy babies born, girl babies born. So I went and you, I couldn't miss one day. Now I'm looking for my birth mothers when she was born. Because uh, my birth would be, uh, because I was, uh, you know, it was illegitimate, being that my birth mother wasn't wed, I would not be listed there, okay? So then what I did, it what was really interesting about that is that the entries gave the mother's, again, my would be my grandmother's name and address, that that would be my maternal grandmother's information, so I went, it took me four weeks painstakingly, every chance I had to get down to that library and make a copy of that, that microfilm. So then the next thing I did was taking the, at the library, looking in the city directory for the hospitals that were around at that time in 1947. There wasn't that many uh, hospitals, there was maybe 10 that would be the Detroit metro area. So I had a feeling that, as I said here, I did a process, I just started right with this one. It was really weird how it came to me because I figured, well, that's downtown, that's in the center of all, everything because all the other hospitals were outside that uh, location, like Deaconess, um, what is it, Hutzel Hospital, Receiving Hospital, uh, Providence Hospital. They were all within a 10 to 20 mile radius. So when I called the hospital, it turns out I talked to the administrator and he went and looked it up. He got back with me and he said, you're here, your information's here. I goes, what? I said, you're kidding. I said, well, then I thought, well, gee, what's, you know, I let him try to see it like the same thing, see if he'll let slip up as to what their names are. He said, no, I'm sorry. I can't tell you that. I said, look, I said, it's going to be Christmas time. I said, can you at least give me, you know, initials that way I can make up my own name just to have something? M N and C S. Okay. So he told me M N was, uh, the, the mother's side, and C.S. was the father. I thought, whoa, she, there, I, the birth father's name was listed. Wow, okay. So then I went back on all those clippings I did, alphabetized them. It was painstaking, but I, determination, if you tell me I can't do it, I said, I'm going to prove you that I'm going to try everything that I can. So then I painstakingly went through all those names, being I have an M and an N. So I'm looking only the N's. And I pulled out about 25 of them from of the uh, close to, oh, 325 strips that I microfilmed. So <laughs> looking for my next step was, I thought, okay, I'm gonna look for a name that sounds or close to a Polish name because from the non-identifying information, it said my birth mother was of Polish descent. The last name that I came with was, uh, I checked of the five names that I could come up with that were Polish. Uh, and I went in the library and then I looked through the city of Detroit death index being I had the grandmother's name to see when they were, if they were still alive or if they're deceased by the address and cross reference with the city directory that I um, said, okay, I checked the four of them. I was on the last one and the, the I got the announcement over the thing and said, uh, the library will be closing in five minutes. And I thought, oh my God, I got to, you know, please, I begged them. I said, I'm on the last one. I said, it's going to kill me. I got to wait another week. 
So then they told me, okay, go ahead. So then I started looking, looking for the death notice, looking for the death notice. Okay, well, guess what? There it is. I was told my mother came from a family of nine. So now I have the descendants, their names. Okay, what happens with the gal, right? She gets married. So therefore the name changes again. Okay, <laughs> so then I'm looking through the list. What I would do is look through the list and I'm looking through an uncommon name. This Esther, P-A-C-H, right? Took a current day phone book, found Esther Pock, called her. Whoops, I called her and uh, we'll leave it at that right now in a quick, because we have to, oh boy, time constraint. Uh, you'll see the picture of that. That's the only picture I have of my birth mother. I can tell you this. I inherited from the waist down. I am uh, long legged, but the big hips, she had. She had large hips and I, I, you'll see in a few that um, I gained that from her. So from that, you see, now I have all these aunts and uncles. I have, I'm thinking, my God. So then I'm counting one, two, three, four. And she said she's was the sixth. They gave me the order, the sixth in a family of nine. Guess what's here? It says Margaret Wilson. But okay, but Margaret Nowicki Wilson, I was given that initial of MN. That's why I said, I gotcha. <laughs> so then what I did, I, we'll, we'll, we'll go back, we'll move on. Um, I called, so as I said, I used the unusual name of Pac. So pretense of doing, under the pretense of doing a family history, and I needed, I called her, and I said, gee, I, you know, I'm doing a family history, and I did have no wiki in my adopted family, so I wasn't lying there. I have no X, no wikis, and no Rockies. My maiden name is Noak. So when I spoke to Esther, she was going through the list of names, and I said, can you bring me up to date? I said, I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Please, you please give me Margaret, please. You know, I'm get to Margaret. Come on, lady. So she gets to Margaret, and she says, uh, well, we don't talk much about Margaret. In fact, she's not, you know, in Michigan. And I thought, oh, where is she? She said, well, I don't know. But who communicates with her is Nadine. I thought, oh, okay, well, can I get a hold of Nadine? So I talked to Nadine over the phone. We met personally, and I told her uh, what has occurred, that of uh, me being, finding out that I'm adopted. And she said, Nadine, my birth mother was Nadine's godmother. I mean, my yeah, my, yeah, my birth mother was Nadine's godmother. So Nadine is the one that Virginia Nowicki, my birth mother's other sister who couldn't have children that my birth mother wanted to um, have uh, Margaret, excuse me, I'm sorry, Virginia adopt me to keep me in the family. So <laughs> Nadine was born and that's when uh, Virginia found out that she was uh, uh, three months pregnant. So needless to say, I got bypassed. You can, what I did, I wrote a letter to Social Security to have it delivered to Margaret. Nadine uh, wrote the letter. You can do this. You know, Social Security will, if you know the name, to find out, like, say, help find out their current location. You can uh, have them, email, have them uh, mail directly to that person, if you know their last known residence, which Nadine did in California, but we didn't know where. So then the waiting period for it to find out begins. So the last week of July, 1991, so from 1987, so from the uh, August of 1987 to July of 1991, Nadine received the letter from the Salvation Army, and we had an address and a phone number. 
because she wanted to contact her too because she missed you know talking to her and that and then she said it makes sense now why margaret was considered the quote unquote black sheep of the family so i when i called margaret I called her and I said to her, I said, does the date September 4th, 1947 mean anything to you? Well, once she heard that, she started crying and whatnot. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want you to have a heart attack. It's not like you're around the corner and down the street that I can stop in. We're talking from Michigan to California, you know, and then she told me how uh, she lights a candle for my birthday. She couldn't believe it that I found her. So uh, through her, I discovered my birth father's full name. Remember I told you I was given the initial C and S? His name was Charles Sales. So now I didn't pick it up again till 1994. Remember I was telling you about the energy needed. I found him through the same principle of using and looking for him finding, and she told me that where he was living in, she said he was a graduate of Royal Oak High School. So I got his picture by being, which is totally unheard of in the 40s. That'd be like somebody graduating from college. So what I did once I found his parents' names, I looked for their death certificate and did find it, and it did list Laura Sales, that was, I knew I had a half sister. And I thought, oh, wow, I've always wanted a sister. Okay. So then I got, because I had the information when her, when Laura's mother died, who was Elizabeth Sales, that uh, her mother, this Aunt Mildred, that is Laura's uh, mother, Elizabeth, her, uh, her sister, so from a death note, so Mildred got me in touch with Laura. So we're almost at the end gang here. So what, uh, the information from my, uh, for the non-identifying information for the birth father is what was supplied, I got lucky, this was supplied by my birth mother. Again, as we were talking earlier, there may be the father's name. There may not. It all depends on the situation. If the guilt or uh, rape, incest, if the birth mother will put the information down, and it depends. There's some birth mothers at the age 15. You know, they don't know. They're not going to put the birth father's name down. So I'd like you to meet my birth father. He was born... Oh, from this is when I found him. It took an October 9th of 1993 to October 12th of 1993. Found him in Louisiana. I helped a, a private investigator in the summer of 1994 solve a five-year Wayne County court case because someone he was looking for it with my last name being Nowak at the time. It was very common. He had a five-year court case that was going to close in a probate. So I found the people for him. So in the meantime, I said, okay, I helped you. This is how you can help me. And I think if you read that Laura and I, we flew to Louisiana with the pretense I was a friend of Laura's to keep her company. Her birth date was on October 10th. When I met him, I'm sitting across from Chuck, Chick, they called him. He kept looking at me like, where do I know you from? You look awfully familiar. I was a spitting image of him at the time. The people that he was staying with, they said, uh, there's no way he can deny who you look like. You are, you know, you're his daughter. Okay. So then he asked me, he said, um, how do you know, uh, Laura? I said, oh, we're, you know, we're friends. You know, we, we have a lot in common. And, you know, I was saying, I thought, oh, good Lord. Now what? So then I told him, I said to him, I said, okay. I said, uh, does the name Margaret Nowicki mean anything to you? Well, he jumped up and totally denied that I was, you know, he said, well, I don't know her. I know her. I said, you know her, don't you? He said, yeah, I know her. I said, hi, dad. 
<laughs> well, that didn't go. He threw him into shock. <laughs> so that was kind of funny at the time. <laughs> so here he is here. Okay. I'm glad. Like I said, 199, I did have a couple of years communicating with him. He did die in 2002 from lung cancer. Now I know my birth mother died of heart conditions. She had a stroke. She had um, uh, borderline diabetes. And then my biological father, he died of lung cancer. He was a very heavy smoker. Glad I quit at that time when I'm 40. So even though I couldn't meet them, you know, together, I took them on paper. At least I reunited them this way. So you can see some of the resemblance. That's my high school picture. That's his. And that's, again, my birth mother. So it's kind of neat when you look at it that way and say, wow, I do belong. And it did help ease the pain. And even though they're gone and the two of them maybe up there in heaven, they're meeting, you know, but right now that's, I have at least in my mind, this, this is a copy of his birth certificate, but again, it's called the amended birth certificate. That's what he was given. And he gave when he applied for his social security, you see how small it is. It's not the legal size where you get the birthplace and that. Okay. As of 2015, there was a change in the Pennsylvania law where descendants of a deceased adoptee could get his original birth certificate. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know if I you know it's small, but I can't help that. But it has, ironically, it has his biological parents' names. Come to find out his birth father was Irish. He was Catholic. His mother was Protestant. Needless to say, back then, the Catholic religion was really frowned on, uh, you know, like, what do you call it? I'm trying to think of that term, the marriages, you know, not, you know, not staying within the religion, Catholic, you know, Catholic, I mean, the person's gone to hell because uh, they didn't stick with the Catholic religion. Okay, here, ironically, the biological father was uh, Catholic and the biological mother was uh, Protestant. In my case, my birth mother was Catholic and the birth father was Protestant. Back in 65, we could not even attend a uh, uh, marriage between a Catholic and a, a Protestant or a non-Catholic. We could not send a card. We could not even uh, send a gift because that was showing acceptance of that marriage. And I'm almost to the end here. There's a couple new surprises. So with the DNA that I received, there's more updated. I didn't um, copy paste the, the newest one. But I've got a lot of people that I'm connected with, but they're like third, fourth, fifth cousins down the road. But you can see that, again, the 50 percent at uh, as from this is from Ancestry.com. That uh, the lot half of it was Polish because it from the non-identifying information was the Polish and the German. That is from the urban family of my biological father. But was nice at that time, that 12% is now 27% Irish as more people. Remember I was saying it was the large, the ancestry is the largest database. At this time in 1997, when I did it, that was only 12%. That's how much it increased by more and more people getting involved. At least now I know from the biological father that his uh, birth parents, the birth father, he that's the part of Ireland he came from, okay? So, piece, like it says, piece of, pieces of my puzzle's life now begin to fit together and make sense. My genetic and biological heritage is now confirmed. In fact, 
I have um, on my birth father's side, my paternal father's side, birth father, his grandfather, my great grandfather, and his son both served in the Civil War for Ohio. So that's kind of neat, you know. So then I thought, oh my God, with all these relatives, I thought, oh good Lord, it was near Christmas time. And I thought, I don't, I'm not gonna write all these Christmas cards. It's a joke between myself and me. So just to show you how long it took from the time I found out as of August 15th, 1987 to August 3rd, I decided to put it in days or years, months and days. So even though it was a long, long, hard journey, that perseverance does pay off. And it's not easy. And if the government, under the terms that I was looking at, at the time I was doing my search, the government didn't help. I couldn't get any help from anybody. All my relatives that could have told me every, anything swore in a Bible never to reveal. So... Here is, oh, and here is my other half sister that I found out when I did meet my biological father in 1994. As we're leaving, because we only stayed a couple days, he goes, Oh, by the way, you have a half sister. I goes, What? What do you mean? I said, When was she born? He told me June 25th, 1973. Oh, good Lord. I said, That's at least 24 years difference. I said, If I ever found her, find her, wait till she finds out that she has an older sister, and I mean an older sister, okay? So, turns out she found me through the DNA in 2017. So, I'd like to introduce my half-sister, that again, you can see the resemblance, and DNA does not lie. You ready? That's her. It turns out when she came here for uh, she came here for Thanksgiving and she lives in Louisiana. She was born legitimately. My birth father and his wife, Patty, were married at the time. However, she is considered an adoptee also. She was put up for adoption because the birth mother, soon after Angela was born, was having grand mal seizures. They were to the point they got violent. So <laughs> he can't take care of the baby. She couldn't. There was no other family where they were living in Louisiana to help out. It took six years before Angela was uh, fully adopted. Okay, So even though it took six years, the one thing I had I did know her birth date, and I knew her name was Angela. So this is the process of adoption, assisting, if you can read it. And that's what we brought up about the donut hole. And Adrian um, and others, <laughs> that with the donut hole, it's not Timbits either. So. <laughs> so when you think about, in fact, she's calling me now. That's funny. I was hoping she could come on, but she's a bit shy, so I have to do it with a picture. So again, when you, hopefully this takes hold, and I pray that it does, that the legislatures do see the benefit and, you know, to get it out of the secrecy. And ironically, my high school motto was, the truth shall set you free, and boy, did it once it did come out. And I want to thank you, everybody, and especially uh, Susan and Valerie and Kathy from Lyon Township. And if, I really suggest going on Facebook. If you use Facebook, please join the group, the Adoptees Advocates of Michigan, along with other groups, and you'll be kept up to date as to what's going on. So anything else? I have a question. I hope I got an answer. <laughs> God, um, I, still, I still got my lifelines here. Okay. So um, the bill, it passed the House of Representatives and it's mm -hmm. going to the Senate next. Um, when is that happening? There you go. 
Anyone, Valerie, go for it, girl. Okay, well, yeah, it, we've been learning how the law works and it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Um, the first place that the bill is going, I mean, next is going to be the Civil Rights Judiciary Committee for the Senate. Um, and we don't have an exact date of when it will be heard in that committee yet. Um, session starts tomorrow. And then, uh, you know, once we've had time to meet with our sponsors and they've done what they do in the background, a date will probably be made to go to the Senate committee. And then it's going to have to pass out of that committee, which we're pretty hopeful. Um, there is only seven members on that committee, five are Democrat, and our main sponsors are Democrat. So we feel like they're probably going to help push that through. Um, then from there, hopefully it will go to the Senate floor, but it could go to another committee. We just don't know yet. It's one of those things where you just, you kind of wait and then you hurry up and, and do all your advocacy work really quick. And then you, you know, hold your breath and cross your fingers and then it either passes or it doesn't. And so that's, that's where we're at. Um, but getting uh, Michigan adoptees involved or birth parents or other family members um, and, letting them help us advocate is going to be crucial this spring. Uh, there will be opportunities to email your senators and um, we, we have a script and we're going to do it in a very concentrated and um, organized way because that seems to be the most effective rather than you know, everybody just randomly reaching out to their legislators. So um, that just shows that that we're organized and that we have a lot of support. Um, so I encourage anybody who would like to see this bill pass um, to, you know, join with the Michigan Adoptee Collaborative. Um, yes. or, I'm sorry, Michigan Adoptee Rights Coalition <laughs> and the Michigan uh, our Adoptee Advocates of Michigan. So, yeah. We're going to need help. Uh people right. supporting us in any way they can whether you know right. not so much financially but maybe letter writing or actually going to Lansing I don't know where everyone lives at this point um can anybody did uh Kathy by any chance did you find out if of the consensus of the people that are have signed up are they adoptees birth parents or are there any uh birth parents oh you you're muted you're muted honey <laughs> okay There, here you go. Okay, I, I am so sorry. I forgot all about it. Oh, it's okay. That's all right. But what I can do is I am going to be sending uh, the handout again to everybody. And I will ask that question and uh, give you, the, give you the, the results when they email me back. Right. And I really appreciate, too, everybody hanging in there because... This is such a complex issue. And then once it's brought to light, it's like the more people that know about this, the maybe the quicker this is going to get passed, that a lot of people will have, especially adoptees, will have the peace of mind whether they decide to choose or not to choose to search. Mm -hmm. You know, it does help, believe me, I'll tell you. It well, makes you feel like I belong. They need that sense of belonging. So yeah. there was a lot of information there today. Oh yeah, I know it is. It is. I mean, do I have your permission to send, uh, because some of the people here were not here. For I the know. First. I, yeah. I, see and that. I send them the first handout also. Oh yeah. Please do. Please okay. do. And then especially when you find out, um, for part one, that the people that didn't get a chance to see part one for whatever reason, they might want to yeah. go into more. I'm pretty sure more. they'll put the video on. And this video, I will send out an email once it's up. Uh, okay. Again, I don't know exactly what day the IT girl is coming back. All but right. um, it, I heard it was supposed to be by the end of the week. So. Okay, that'd be great. I, hey, no pressure. No pressure, hon, right? Hey, I waited how many years? <laughs> I can wait a couple of weeks. No, I'm sure everybody else can too. The, the bit information that surprised me because I've been wanting to find the certificate that has the birth father's 
if I get non-identifying, I was hoping to get an age, but now you're saying that there might not even be any information on him at all. Right. But then the DNA, do you have the DNA, any DNA? Well, it, actually, my husband did put the DNA in because this would be his grandfather that uh, we we're looking for because his father was adopted. Um, mm -hmm. We know his name was Frank Wegman from Minnesota, Winona, but there are three Frank Wegmans in okay, hold Winona, on. Minnesota. Hold on there, lady. Hold on. Well, Give me, send me that information because I think I can help, okay? Well, there's there's three Frank Wegmans and they're all related. So my husband okay. is related to all of these three. But I need an age to figure out because in actuality, the mother and the father were both related. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it throws the DNA off when both of them are related. Okay, send me. Can I say something about that really quick? Because I think okay. that I sent you a list or I sent Carol a list about books that you should think about adding to the South Lion Library um, about these topics. And I just wanted to add, you're telling a story that is in one of the books that I recommended. <laughs> um, we have in Michigan, the very first adopted person whoever was able to find their family through DNA. Um, and his name is Richard Hill and he lives over in, in uh, Oh, West yeah, I've had, I've had him here. Have you? Excellent. Yeah. So then he had, his book is all about a similar situation where there was, you know, brothers and trying to figure out yeah, yeah. which yeah. one yeah. was actually the parent. Um, it was pretty dicey. <laughs> and I don't know if you read his whole book, but I think you would probably get a lot out of it if you did. <laughs> okay, I will. Uh, I have, I do have his book here. Oh, yeah. still good. It seems to me we read it as the genealogy book club book, but gosh, that had to be seven, eight years ago already. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think okay. I have a question. When you got your nine identifying information, it didn't give you birth years? No. That's why I had to create a framework. They gave me, an, you know, they said that your mother, your birth mother was uh, what, 18 years old at the time. I'd have to go back over that. So that's when I created a time frame where I said, okay, if I was born September 4th, 1947, Subtracting 47, uh, from 47, subtracting 18 years, which would meant that she was born somewhere between September 3rd, 1928 to September 5th, I think it was, yeah, September 4th or 5th of 1930. But then because I was doing the legal news, and a lot of times it didn't show up. You had to follow it for an additional three to four weeks. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. I couldn't miss the name. So once I did that and it confirmed it, once I did find her, I asked her, when were you born? And guess what? February 10th, 1929. Wow. That's amazing. Cause we share yeah. the same birthday, just a different year. <laughs> that's right. But when I got my mom, my uh, non-identifying information, uh -huh. They gave me their birth years. Oh, jeez. You lucky it did, girl. <laughs> it gave me their birth years, but <laughs> I hired a CI oh. through um, Latrice Ross of Wayne County. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't believe she did the footwork. I don't. Uh, because I got an email from her about three months later um saying that my mother called her and she was all in a frantic um she didn't want mail sent to her house she didn't want to be ever contacted again um maybe true maybe not but mm -hmm. after 57 years mm -hmm. why would you have that type of reaction um if your daughter was looking for you does her family know that maybe her family and never know uh, knew <laughs> that she had a baby out of wedlock well, she had to because in my report, it says that her mother made her give me up because she didn't like my dad. Mm -hmm. 
But the guy listed as my dad on my birth certificate is nowhere on my DNA at all. Okay, that happens like that one gentleman, that black other black gentleman that was given information that he was went to uh, outside the United States. I can't remember exactly. You're talking well. about Ned Andre? Yes, and yes. You can actually watch testimony. Ned Andre tells that story because he gave testimony to uh, the House Committee that our bill had to go through first. And Monique, I think I recognize your name. I think you're already yeah. in our group. And I can send you a link to that if you want to watch it. Please. Um, because it, yeah. And honestly, you know, you brought up a really interesting point, And that is that depending on the adoptee, depending on who they talk to, depending on which county and which judge, whatever, you all get every, we all get different information. It's not consistent. And one of the things that we do in our group is we try to have a monthly workshop where we try to help adopted people or even, you know, just try to connect and figure out what information is missing and how can they ask for it in a different way. Susan has had some great success in um, asking all the right questions and she encourages people to, you know, ask your CI or, you know, for information, then maybe go back six months later or a year later and try I again went, and you might I get different through, information. Well, I was adopted through Methodist Children's Home mm -hmm. with um, a Star Jenkins is over there now. If anybody's on here for Methodist Children's Home, she is the worst. She wants to help in no way at all. Uh, then I got with Latrice Ross. Oh my God, that lady is heaven sent. <laughs> yeah. Let heaven me ask sent. you. I'm sorry, uh, Monique. What? Yes. Uh, can I ask you your religious affiliation? With who? With you. What is your? I'm religion? Baptist. Okay, as Baptist, do I'm not totally familiar. Are they? Do you, were you baptized, even as baptized? I mean, a Baptist? Yeah. I, well, you know what? I don't know. Okay. I don't know what my mother's religion is. Um, they The information they gave me on my dad, he's deceased now. So they gave me all of his information. Um, I have a sister and a brother over there. I look nothing like them, nothing. Hmm. It's we not uncommon have... for the the father that's on the birth certificate to not be accurate. You're really only going to get the right information through DNA. Because... And about the Baptists, no, they do not baptize babies and make a record of okay, it. Okay, thank so, you. That's what you Catholic they do. You know what they do is we dedicate our children back. Right. Yeah, they have, they have a dedication. Dedication and give them back to God. They do do that. Okay. But for her to, I thought it was just like mind-blowing to me. She wouldn't give any medical history. She wouldn't say if I had siblings or anything. Ladies, I'm gonna let and you I thought talking. I had the right to have medical information. I'm going to let you guys keep talking. I've got to break down another room before we oh, close. Do we so still you have guys can talk. Um, I'm just going to step away. Oh, great. If and anybody still like to stick around a bit or... Carol, you are a co-host, so you can shut it down when oh, you're okay. done. But I, I'm sorry, I do have. Oh no, hey with... Kathy, you know it was supposed to end at eight, but see. Oh, eight... I'm so sorry. No, 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 no yes, you don't be. It... No, no, this is <laughs> this is why I was hoping it almost was part three. We would have had it. Should have well, done a part. Yes, three. But if if it were only me in the library, I yeah. just don't want everybody else to have to stay. So... Oh no, 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 honey. Hey. I appreciate Kathy. You guys will can talk. Keep talking. Oh, thank you. Thank you, lady. Thanks. Bye bye, hon. Have a so, good night. If I think that the CI's information was not done and it was just something that she did, we only got one CI in Wayne County now. Um, how can I go and request um my records through a judge? Do I still have to go through Latrice Ross, right? Well, can I get a different judge? Okay, wait a minute. Hang on. <laughs> what you would have to do is, did you ever, did you petition the Wayne County Court Juvenile Court at all? Yes, I did. Did you have a meeting? Did you, did it, did they give you a meeting 
that you could no. go to the court. You were supposed to get that if you petition the court. And I think it's, again, at that time in 1987, I paid $100. There is that, oh, I don't have that form, but it's, um, if you ask them, you want the form to petition the court of jurisdiction, which you know for sure is Wayne Carol, County. Yeah. It's a P PCA 327. That's I'll that one. I'll put a link in the chart, in the chat to the Please. form. Sure. Right, because that's what I was trying to get a hold of you. I was trying to ask you, what was that form that you were talking about that I was trying to get a hold of you on? Ah. Remember, that's what I needed. But that's okay. okay. I still love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after I do that, I have a hearing with the judge and who else? Yes, you will have a hearing with the judge. You present your case as to why you need the judge to open your file. The reasons. Remember I said to have a valid reason? Okay. Okay. You can tell them, you know, I guess maybe to make sure, uh, being that Valerie knows you and Susan knows you are ready to just to clarify your reason when you fill out that form. Are you guys, can you guys help her out too with that to make sure she sure. has the right wording of it? Cause they could be really sticklers and but you never know the judge, pro, uh, the juvenile probate judge that you'll get that will handle the case. Because I think there's at least three or four of them. If I'm not okay. mistaken. Yeah. Monique, if you want to send me a Facebook message, you and I are already kind of in contact. If we can, I'd be happy to help you file that. Okay. Form. No problem. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. Great. Okay. okay. Anything else? Yeah, I have a question. I hope I got an answer. <laughs> okay. My if not, my, my lifelines are still here. <laughs> my grandmother gave up three children and kept the rest of what children she had. Okay. One, I was lucky to find through the Children's Aid Society through Canada. So I found her other half sister. Now, through DNA testing, I have a first cousin that has come on there. She is my grandmother. She belongs to the one of the children, the mother that my grandmother gave up. She has a half brother mm. and he was in contact before with the father before they had a falling out. She knows who her father is. So she tried to can't contact him and the ex-wife had told her it was just a night fling. They were drunk. That's all it was. <laughs> and they refuse to give her the mother's name, but it's her father too that's there now. It's her right. biological father. And he knows who her mother is, and that's all she wants to do is find out her mother's name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what would I do to help her get through to the you know, get oh, through to him? He's okay. 70, 70 or He's 82 years old. I mean, oh, geez. Well, then he, if he's 82, he's outside the the donut hole, right? Yeah. Okay. So, therefore, she should, well, again, she's a descendant. He's still alive, right? Yeah. Darn. And it, he's the only one that has the information of who her mother's name is. You're best off trying to help us get this law passed. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. There you go. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. We're, drafting, we're drafting you. <laughs> that would help. Yeah. There you go. Where do you live? I mean, what city do you live in? I'm in uh South Lyon. Okay. So Valerie, she, I think you're in He lives in Minneapolis. And so does her father, her real father. Okay, so if this I, is an adoption from a different state, they have different laws in every state. Right. So yeah. it, it may be different where they live. Okay, you said but, Minneapolis might open the laws this summer? Uh, yeah, Minnesota, they passed it. So it is officially that they uh -huh. will be opening it up. But the, the thing is, is that when these laws get passed, it takes them a minute to get enacted because these... You know, there's a lot of uh, paperwork that they have got to sort through and figure out the, their new system for when an adoptee requests their information. So it is passed, but it won't actually go into effect until this coming up summer. In the handouts that Carol provided and the library provided, there is links 
in there and one of them is to the Adoptee Rights Law Center. And you'll see a link that says um, uh, Adoptee Rights for all the states. It's like a map of the country and you can mm -hmm. click on that state yeah. and you can go to a page and it'll tell you what is the adoptee law there. It's a really great resource. So we made sure to include it. And again, you'll find that under Adoptee Rights Law Center in the packet that you all were provided. And oh, the same okay, thing you. with on Adoptees United, their website will have the link to register for tomorrow night. Correct? Okay. Yep. Being okay. it's from Minnesota and Greg Greg should be on too. And he's the attorney for I'm gonna try to make it tomorrow night. I have <laughs> ugh, I forgot about stuff. I signed up, but I'm gonna try to make it. Is that gonna be recorded tomorrow? Do you know? Oh, we well, have to fill me in if I can't make it okay. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, I didn't see Mark. Hello, Mark. He's muted. Unmute, hon, please. Earth to Mark. Hello. Come in, Mark. <laughs> Over and out. <laughs> I'm getting slap happy, I tell you. <laughs> but uh, he's muted. Yeah. So anyhow, um, gosh, I can't thank Susan and Valerie and anybody like yourself, Vicki, that came tonight. And I know there's other questions and whatnot, but it's, and Monique, I'm sorry, didn't mean to leave you out, <laughs> that, um, oh man, I, it's just gonna, I, ugh, because I've talked to Valerie about this idea since nine, since 1920. Oh my God. <laughs> Time to go since before for the 2020 election. If nothing was done, I had planned to get 467,000 plus signatures to get a petition signed, a what they call a citizen's initiative. Anytime that the law that's on the books, that the citizens, you know, like you see these people, hey, sign this petition, sign that petition. It would have taken a lot. However, with as many adoptees that are out there and the different situations, I'm sure I probably could have gotten maybe even over the 467,000 I needed. Mm -hmm. However, what happened? COVID hit, right? So if nothing had, if this had not come about, the House Bill 5148 and 49, bye-bye, Kathy. I would have gone for, which we still would have that alternative to go for it. For No, not really. To be honest with you, that's really, unfortunately, the petition is great to bring it to everybody's, um, so they all know about it, but it won't change the law. A petition won't change the law. And if, it's, it's, if it's really. Voted, no, no. If, I'm sorry, hon. If it's voted on, if it goes on the ballot, the election yeah. ballot. Then it would we would still have to come up with the language yeah. in order to change the current law, right? Correct. Which can get pretty dicey, actually. Oh. Which is why we have a donut hole right now because someone tried to help the situation in the past, and it wasn't retroactive to all the adoptees mm -hmm. previous to 1980, right. which created a big, big, big right. problem. So. That's um, oh, we my have, bubble. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in New York, they did a petition. They did one of those change.org petitions, and they were able to get like 10,000 people to sign on it. But it didn't really do anything to change the law, but it did have the capacity of letting the public know what's happening. And mm -hmm. that is still a very valuable thing. Right. So, but it, at this point, we're just hoping that this law is going to pass. And um, we won't have a lot of opposition. And we do have some opposition. Um, and they typically come in the form of the Catholics, uh, mm -hmm. doctor agencies, as well as um, a couple other different groups that are worried about birth parent privacy. But the, the most important thing to think about is that birth parent privacy is obsolete. Now that we have DNA, 
-hmm. they said at one point, just about everybody's in the DNA system one way or another. So if you can't find your birth parent right now, you could probably find a relative of theirs and do the work through a genealogist or someone like Susan, even a search angel and um, find out who your family member is. Um, so this idea of protecting privacy of mothers, um, not only was it uh, ruled against in Oregon in 1999, uh, the Supreme Court said that birth parent privacy, they do not have the uh, right to lifelong anonymity um, for the simple reason that you can't legally guarantee that a child, when it's given up for adoption, will actually be adopted. You can mm -hmm. relinquish a baby, but you can't say for sure that that child will be adopted by anybody. And since the birth parent can't make that guarantee, they can't can't be privy to lifelong uh, anonymity. Right. Um, maybe at the time of birth, and maybe through closed adoption, mm -hmm. but once the uh, adoptee becomes an adult, right. um, they have the right to search if they want to. Oh, I got so, a question. Why is Michigan the last state to get this law to try to pass it? We're not the last state. Oh, if we okay. did pass it, we would only be the 16th state that has acted it. Another 15 have. So we still got we still got another 35 to go. And unfortunately, it's not a full issue. It is a state by state issue because adoption is controlled by the state. So we have to pass this law in 50 states. However, uh, beyond that, and I just want to make a note of this. I don't know if anybody here was adopted from overseas, but there is one issue that is impacted federally uh, with adoptee rights, and that is adoptees who are brought here from overseas. Uh, many of them don't have citizenship, believe it or not. I didn't mm -hmm. know that until I got mm -hmm. into adoptee rights. But if you know some adoptees who were brought over from Korea or Haiti or a lot of other different countries, um, sometimes those adoptions were not completely paperwork legitimate. And then when they came here, uh, the adoptive parents didn't necessarily follow through on getting their citizenship taken care of. And these adoptees do not find out until they're adults, sometimes when they're going to get social security, uh, they find out, well, hey, they've lived there their whole life since they were an infant, but they're not actually a US citizen. So adoptee rights is important for adopted people. And, you know, we have situations for domestic adoptees here, but also there's big federal issues with um, uh, adopting from overseas. Or so then they, they can't they can't vote. No, they, they are allowed to vote. Um, it just oh. it depends on the everybody's situation oh, wow. is different. Wow. Um, and it like there is a case right now of a of a adoptee out of Indiana who is. I think only 13 years old, severely disabled, came here from Haiti, and now uh, it's all over the news. The mother is saying they're going to deport her child who oh, is geez. disabled back to Haiti, which realistically may or may probably would not happen because he's severely disabled. But mm. um, it's actually the, the fault of the adoptive parent that they did not dot all their... Yep eyes and cross all their T's when they brought the child here. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of adoptive parents, you know, feel like, well, I'm going to cut through the red tape and just get a foreign born child and adopt him. And then I don't mm -hmm. have to deal with the agencies and the expense and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that really penalizes the adoptee later on in life when they try to get citizenship, the things that everybody's allowed to have. Your pension or be able to leave the country um you know sometimes they can't uh get back and we've had 50 adoptees deported back to their country of origin even though they grew up as americans can't speak the language and don't know anybody there oh my god so yeah it's a big oh, problem dear. well see that's what i was saying you could make this this topic it could be part five yeah. ten up to you know like the <laughs> movies <laughs> you know yeah. superman uh, part 10 or something you know right oh, unfortunately it's just not common knowledge not everybody no. knows about it but i'm oh. glad that carol you did a great job carol thank you thank i was nervous <laughs> oh, yeah. thank you carol you did a good well, thanks job for, hey you guys were my lifeline yeah, you don't know how much i appreciate <laughs> that oh that helped make a success and I want everybody, hopefully, that came tonight 
to just hop on. Let me know. If, I don't know if you'll know the names. I could find maybe get the names if they join. Well, you, like you said, Monique is already uh, a member. Thank you. Yeah. I am. And Vicki, hopefully tonight you get a chance. <laughs> She's yeah, just, I, well, I'm drafting. I'm drafting Vicky right now. Okay. <laughs> All so that information me, is in your ha handouts. And, mm -hmm. you know, just there's a lot. There's so much in there. Just and take then, a look at it all. And then Valerie, take you week, right? thank you. Valerie, it was, you know, Valerie had a good hand. You know, I couldn't have done it without you, Valerie. Thank you. I mean, oh, thanks. You did it before without oh, me. Oh, well, you yeah, but you made, it, I'm just glad you, you, you made it more sense. And then she helped oh. update it to current, you know, information. That's why. Happy with to do what it. we did, what I try to take you back in time, everybody back in time to bring you up in time. And I hope that that was my goal. I hope it got accomplished. Did you feel that, Vicki? Help mm -hmm. me out. Okay, good. Yes. I got yeah. my goal. Good. You that was it. And then just also, Carol, uh, Susan's workshop. We have that monthly oh, workshop. Oh, yeah. It's we got to bring yeah. Susan. Susan, yeah. do I have to mention her too? Oh, good. <laughs> No, you don't. You don't. Oh, no, Susan, you, don't. you did. But, but join the group and come to uh, one of the workshops. It's the first Tuesday of every month, and we talk about getting information so from if the state you, of Michigan. And if that you know good. your friends, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vicki, yeah, too, your friends, even though they may not be adopted, they in turn might know somebody that is adopted. Yeah. yeah. So you is that possible? It sounds like it's possible. Yeah, I could get oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Like again, Vicki, you're drafted. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, ladies. Um, no pressure, Vicki. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Just get on that Facebook page when we close up now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have to look for it. Okay. I'm going to be looking. Vicki, what's your last name? Moorhead. M O O R H E A D. M O O R R H E A D. No E. Oh, okay. E -G -A -D. I'm going to be looking for her. So is Vicki. I mean, Valerie. And so is Susan. All right. <laughs> so ladies, gentlemen, Mark, I hope he didn't fall asleep or anything. I'd love to have had him chime in somewhere, but that's okay. Mark, go to Adoptees Advocates of Michigan Facebook page, please. <laughs> Okay, talk to everybody, and I'm hoping I can see you guys tomorrow night. You know, if not, I'll get, you know, we'll hook up through Messenger. Love you guys. I'm going to sign off. I'll see you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Carol. Bye, -bye. everybody. Good Thank job. you, Carol. Bye, Kathy. You can go home now. Thank <laughs> you, Kathy. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs> Bye, Vicki. Bye, Mark. Bye. Bye, Bye Valerie. Bye-bye, hon. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Good night, hon. See you on Facebook. Okay. Sounds okay. Good. You're drafted. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, <laughs> sweetie. Bye-bye. Good night, Mark.